Thank you for joining me today. Uh, and today we're going to talk about um, machine learning. So patterns, predictions, and programming. That's me, Frank Greco. I'm from the New York Java SIG. I want to thank uh, Pratik and Vincent and the rest of the Atlantic Jug um, for holding DevNexus. It's nice to see people face to face after a long, long break. Um, so this is awesome. So let's talk about machine learning. And um, especially about um, the Java API, the JSR381, uh, which I worked on with my colleagues are in, in Serbia. But I want to give a little bit of a history on machine learning and patterns. Uh, talk a little bit like why I was interested in it and why it's pretty cool. And then we'll talk about the chat GBT thing since it's a pretty hot topic and I'll show you the API. Um, so I'm, I've been quite lucky in my career. I mean, I've been around for a while. I didn't dye my hair white for the conference. <laughs> but um, I've been quite lucky. Usually in your career, you get a chance to live through maybe one major you know, a sea change in, in technology, maybe two. So I've been lucky that I've gone through four. This is, so it was Unix and C when I was working for Bell Laboratories back in the day. Then it was, I was working on hypertext before it became the web. Uh, um, and then it was Java, which was, I thank James Gosling all the time for like my, my mortgage in my house, <laughs> it's like my career. Uh, and now we have machine learning. So we're at the start of this phase of machine learning that's gonna be with us for the next 10, 20 plus years. So this is a huge change. Don't think of it as just like a little, there's a little chat interface that people are playing around with and it's on 60 Minutes, which is a you know, US show. I think it's a US show, uh, just a US show. Um, it's, it's way more than that. We're talking about something that's gonna affect all of our lives and it's not just our programming lives. This affects geopolitics in, in countries. So, so this is quite, quite interesting. So a little bit about, um, a little history about machine learning. So it's, it's nothing new. <laughs> so here we have this, um, this gentleman from MIT. He said back in the 40s, and this is the 40s, not, not a few years ago, like <laughs> 40s, that one of the most interesting aspects of the world is that it's about patterns. And I would say, I would twist, you know, tweak it a little bit, say it's an interesting aspect of the universe. So I, I have, varied background um, in music. I see some of my fellow no pointers in the audience. So I have music background, but also I have an astrophysics background, and I studied things like supernova, you know, when stars kind of, they, they get chaotic. When things get, they start doing this, what happens? There's a supernova, and things come back to a more stable state. So there's something called Chandrasekhar's limit, when there's a certain ratio of the mass, to, and, it, and it blows up, and it comes back to a steady state. So I thought, was, thought that was fascinating. And then in music, why was Elvis popular? Why were the Beatles popular? Why are certain trends popular? Well, at that time, there was chaos, right? It's like Elvis, like post-war, the Beatles, post-50s. So there's, there's reasons why things happen, right? There's we, reasons why languages are invented, right? There's, there's reasons for everything. So patterns, are, are with us all over, right? And, and if certainly if you're a musician, you know, you know that music is all about patterns. Whether it's rock or jazz or pop, whatever, rap, hip hop, there's patterns. And my, my uh, master's degree uh, project many years ago was um, generating new music in the style of an artist. So generative AI is, is not anything <laughs> brand new. It's decades old. And if you're around in dot com and you're a musician, you heard of things like band in a box. Anybody heard of band in a box back in dot com where you, you can say, I want to hear a jazz solo in the style of Miles Davis. There's a piece of software for 20 bucks that would play that. And it was pretty good. So again, generative AI is not something that's brand, brand new. So I happen to work for a stock exchange and we look for insider trades, uh, traders, um, and we look for patterns. So I was interested in patterns. At Bell Labs, I was interested in fractal compression, which looks at patterns instead of uh, mathematical compression. It looked at, well, it's mathematical. Fractal compression, which, which, which is based on patterns. I worked for, you may have heard, a company called Lehman Brothers. <laughs> um, I have stories to tell you <laughs> about, that, about that week, that last week. But we looked for patterns um, in, in portfolios. 
and we thought we can tell you why your portfolio went up or went down, but we really couldn't. We couldn't, we could find correlation, but we couldn't find causation, which is important, right? But it was basically patterns. And we know about this book, right? Everybody, all of us know this, know this book, right? Design patterns. But that book was patterned after a talk at, at a conference. Um, that Ken Beck and, and Ward Cunningham did in 87. So that book was patterned about a book, about a talk about patterns. And that talk was patterned for a book called A Pattern Language. And this was about patterns. Construction patterns. Building patterns. It has nothing to do with software. But it was based upon that. So it was patterned so our, our design, our, the, the Goff book was designed about patterned languages and patterned after a talk about architecture patterns, which was based upon building patterns from a long time ago. So the next time you use decorator pattern in your code, you know where that came from, somebody's cave. <laughs> so patterns have been with us for a long time. We know about regular expressions. Do you know that regular expressions were invented to experiment with machine learning. So regular expressions were invented in 1951 to experiment with artificial neural networks. And it was, the use case was text. And we use this every day. And it, it was probably because of Ken Thompson, the father of Unix, that he found it fascinating. And he happened to put it into his little editor. It, it was a line editor. And he put regular expressions into that and his colleagues were kind of, oh, this is really cool. Let me put that in my, so we had grep and we got other things that, so, so Ken was very instrumental in popularizing it. But that's where it came from. And, and here's actually, our neural networks, 1943. 1943. That's a long time ago. And then here's regular expressions, the, the, the paper on it in 51. So patterns are all over the place, right? They're um, in, in music, they're in, um, Astrophysics, they're in business, they're in trading, they're in sports. You know, here we have like whether you're playing um, American football or football where you actually use your foot. <laughs> um, so it's, it's uh, and animals, I mean, if you have dogs or cats, you know about patterns, right? They understand patterns. My dog certainly understands patterns where when I go to dinner, it's like, well, there's food over there, there's a pattern, right? And there's other types of things, like here's, here's an interesting Really interesting thing is it, about intelligence. So here's there's a little graph of fr France on the left, and uh, engineers designed the, the rail system all throughout the country. So somebody had a picture like a like something that looked like fr uh, France, and they put pieces of slime food, like so slime is a mold, and they put food where the cities would be. The slime duplicated the train circuitry, this train. A slime is one cell. So you start thinking about intelligence and patterns, like you really start thinking about human intelligence, right? So we're, we're way above one cell, but the slime mold duplicated the network. That was, that was interesting. So I, I got really psyched about this. This is like, I mean, I love my programming and I love, you know, the learning about language, but this is like, this is something big. This is something really, really big. So machine learning is about patterns. It's all about pattern, looking at a data set and looking for patterns. And then you either predict something or you generate something. Right, and, and I, I drew this diagram. A lot of my students ask me, what's the difference between machine learning and deep learning and this and that and AI. So, I mean, we're, we're supposed to be the smart people in the room, right? I mean, if you watch the 60 Minutes thing, it's like, what the hell are they talking about? It didn't make any sense. So AI is the big thing, right? And a subset of AI, which you would think artificial intelligence, it's sort of simulating the intelligence of a human. You could argue whether that's intelligent or not, but that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and then there's a subset of AI that's about pattern recognition. There is another subset of subsets that are not about pattern recognition, like expert systems, knowledge graphs, all these other stuff on the right here. But we're, we're focused more on machine learning. So machine learning is about learning. We're, we're training the machine. We're giving it data. Look for patterns to train it. Now a subset 
of machine learning is deep learning, where we have sophisticated neural networks, sophisticated algorithms. You know, there's not just one neural network, there's classes of neural networks. So we, and we have cloud, and we have computation, we have GPUs, so we have a lot of computing resources. So that's deep learning. But in the press, you'll read about machine learning. So when you read about machine learning, they usually mean deep learning. So deep learning is machine learning with you know, com computational resources. Now, inside of deep learning, we have sort of like the traditional ML, which is predictive, like the weather, right? If you're a meteorologist, there's, there's predictive. And now what's popular now is generative. So there were the patterns, now we're gonna generate something new. And as I said, it's, it's really nothing new. I mean, in dot com, we were generating new music. And now we're doing it with ChatGPT, we're generating text. And it's not just ChatGPT, I mean, Google has BARD, and, and there's Facebook has their, their mo language models. So that's, that's the big picture. I mean, I got this question so many times from my students, I said, I'm just gonna draw a diagram. So that's, that's the diagram. Okay, this is different from what we're used to. The top is more what we're used to. We, we have data, we, we know we wanna build the models in our head, and we come up with a result. Machine learning is almost like the inverse of that. And it's really like two phases of it. First, you train the machine, right? The machine has to learn. That's why it's called machine learning. So the first phase is the learning part, where you said like, this is, this is the data, and here's what I wanna get. Like, here's the result, I already know the result. You know, you should, you should give me this. If you see this, you should give me this. Right? If you see this pattern, I want this result. And that generates a model. And then you take the model, and you persist it in some file or some persistence, persistence mechanism. And then the second phase, which I'm not, it's not on this picture, but you have the model, and then you have new data against that model. And then you ask it, so, okay, is it gonna rain tomorrow? Is, it gonna be, is the sun gonna be out tomorrow? Can I trade on this thing? Can I, so it's predicting or generating. So it's a little different from the way we're normally used to writing software. Now, a lot of us are Java developers. So um, my colleague Zorin and I, many years ago, many years ago, four or five years ago, well, we were giving talks on uh, machine learning at conferences, and we get this all the time. It's sort of like a little riff on Henry Ford, right? You, you can have any car you want, any color you want as the car, except uh, as long as it's black, right? So here's a riff on that. Um, so if you're a Java developer, you know, we didn't want Python programmers to have all the fun. Not that Python is a bad language, it's a great language. It's a great language. So we need to promote Java. So what, what Zorn and I did, we said like, we need to build a real Java library for ML. There's, there are libraries out there for Java developers, but you have to be a C programmer to understand them. Like you would get like, here's, here's a, a method, and, and, and C would be a function, or uh, function, and you said, just pass these 50 parameters. It's like, what? <laughs> so the parameter list is like humongous. And, and uh, you know, pass a pointer. It's like, what? <laughs> so there was, there was this cultural problem. So we said, we, we're, we're Java developers. We want something that's, that's Java native. So we didn't want another, another JavaScript, what I call a doomsday scenario. So I'm not being totally pejorative against JavaScript. I mean, many of my good friends are JavaScript programmers. Um, so if you're, if you're in a band, right, and, you, and there's a sax player, there's a drummer, there's a guitar player, there's a bass player, and you're told that you have to create music, and I gave you all a broken kazoo, you probably could come up with something. Is it the best thing? Is it the most creative thing? Can you express yourself with a broken kazoo? I don't know. So we didn't want that scenario to, to duplicate because the web was just phenomenal. It was a ph phenomenal thing that Tim Berners-Lee gave us for humanity. We had one language. I said, how can I express myself? I have, you know, so we didn't want that to happen. And, and both of us being musicians, we know we didn't want that to happen because you want to express yourself through your instrument, right? So at first we thought like, well maybe it's just us. So let's ask some people. So we asked all the big companies. We had co conference calls, at Zoom, uh, Zoom calls. Actually, even before the pandemic. So we had um, regular, regular old-fashioned calls. Everybody 
wanted a Java API for machine learning with 100%. And we talked to like senior techs at all these companies. Everybody said, Python is great for prototyping. It's great for the data scientists. But we're a Java shop. We want Java to deploy. OK, we'll build the models in Python. That's fine, you know, data scientists. And you know, students are told, you have to learn Python to be a data scientist. Well, I know if they're teaching thousands of students, not all of them are going to catch on to data science. And a good test is, so Andrew Eng, who's one of the, the big names in, in AI and ML, he has these fantastic videos, free videos from Stanford. So if you watch the first one, it's all about intro to ML, and, and it's, it's like an hour or 90 minutes long. It was fantastic. It's like, wow, this is great. I'm going I'm to watch the rest of these. Then you watch the second one. And then there's matrix manipulation, and dot products, and eigenvectors, and this and that. And I know my students, not all of them are going to catch on to that. And a lot of people I know are application developers. right? So if you look at the old developers on a curve, the middle of the Gaussian curve is where we all are. Right? We may not be data scientists. Only a few of us will be data scientists. Let's face it. That's the way it works. I worked on Wall Street. There's only a few people who were quants. And that's the way it worked. And they, were, they weren't the best programmers. I, they used to always come over to my desk. Like, uh, I have this thing in S plus or R, and I need to, we have to put it in production. And I was like, you ain't putting that in production. There's no way. So we had to rewrite it in C++. That's a pattern. <laughs> so, so we came up with a JSR. It took us a number of years because we're not lawyers. We didn't understand some of the legal aspects of this. So um, the technical part was more straightforward. So we now have official, official JSR. Um, now, I don't have time to go through all of it, but that, that's the GitHub link. Um, there's, a, there's a readme, or no, getting started down there. I mean, you, you guys will get the slides. Um, and we have all kinds of examples on, on that. It's, we didn't want to come up with an ML API for everything, right? And we know being senior people, you don't want to boil the ocean, because you'll never get done. So we said, let's pick visual recognition. So we picked visual recognition, and, to, and it's, here's the general architecture that we came up with. And I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, but that, that beige colored thing, that's the API that you use. Everything else is sort of like our, our architecture. And it's, it's JSRs are APIs. And you have to have a reference implementation to prove that your API works. So we use DeepNets, the, the um, community edition, as uh, a reference implementation. Amazon has implemented our API, so uh, Frank Liu from Amazon um, implemented the API, so on Amazon you can have the, uh, this implementation. Uh, so people are free to implement it using whatever, whatever engine you want. Okay, so, so there's, if you want to take a snap of that, that's, that's um, the, the reference implementation. All right, uh, then here's uh, Frank Liu's article on InfoQ, which we didn't know about it until somebody said, did you read about Frank Liu's? I said, wow, that's pretty cool. All right, so um, I'm, gonna t I'm gonna talk through the demo and hopefully I'll have time to show the demo at, at the end. But so here's, the, when you're designing, designing an ML application, here's the basic phases. Like you, you have to do data prep. This is not drawn to scale. If I were to draw it to scale, the data prep would take the size of this building. <laughs> you have to have clean data, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So you wanna have clean data, unbiased data. It's easy for me to say, but this is the important thing is have good data. And then you train the model and you go through, make sure you train it, make sure you test the model, right, which is very important, and then you put it into production, and then, then you test it in production to make sure it's giving you the right results. That's the basic workflow. So I have pictures of chihuahuas, and I, and I use only at the bottom left, there's 872 images I use. I use the Stanford, there's a data set for dogs. It's not a lot of data, it's only 872 images. So I trained it on, light-colored chihuahuas. Not dark-colored Labradors, or dark-colored chihuahuas, but light-colored chihuahuas. And so our API, after you train it, so our API says, do you want fast training and low accuracy, or you, know, you want to take a long time, and I'll give you a better accuracy. So either it'll take five minutes to train, or maybe 20 minutes to train, or be several hours. So you, know, you I went for a nice dinner three hours later. So using, here's, here's our builder um, pattern to, to create um, a classifier. 
So I gave it new images. Here's some new images. There's three chihuahuas and a, and a mushroom, a set of mushrooms. And if you use our API, and here's, this is how simple it is. You, you have a classifier, and then now I have a model, and the model is the, uh, my model file there, that, that fourth line uh, below the image height and image width. Import the model. So the model is in a file. It's persisted. I'm reading the model, and then I just classify it. So like, give me the predictions of those, of these four, oops, I'm sorry, th these four images. So, sorry, so um, I get th this data. So the one on the left is 88.5%, sure, that's a, that's a chihuahua, the one in the middle is 88.68, the one to the right is 87.7. Now the mushroom it was 66%. Now that's, that's worse than flipping a coin, right? So what does that tell me? That tells me I didn't use enough data. I didn't train it properly. And if this came up for a production application as opposed to just for fun, I would say we need more images and we need to train it a longer time. So when you use this API, you start to learn about ML. It's like, well, that's way too high. 66%, no, that's, that's, that's way too high. So it teaches you about how to train the model, um, how much data you should have. The more data, the better. Okay, so, and there's the getting, getting started guide if you wanna snap that. Okay. I think Vincent and, and Pratik are putting these slides on, on devnexus.com or something. I'm not sure if anybody. If not, you just ping me, I'll send you, this, I'll send you the slides. Okay, so that's our, that's our JSR. JSR 3D1, and I, if you're a Java developer and you wanna do visual recognition, I highly suggest doing it, and you'll feel totally at home. You won't have to know, understand C language or pointers, uh, passing pointers between Java and C. It's, it's, it's very, very Java friendly. Okay. Now, what's popular now? Millions of people are talking about ChatGPT and other language models, right? There's the Facebook one, there's a the Google one, now there's a whole host of other ones. What is that all about? Well, remember from that diagram that I had, there was predictive ML, and then there's generative ML. So we're talking about the generative ML. Sometimes it's called generative AI. It's really generative ML. Okay, so what do you think the fastest programming language is gonna be this year? Python? Go? Julia, Java? All right, well, let's hold on to that thought. <laughs> let's hold on to that thought. Let's, 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 let's dive into ChatGPT and language models. Okay, so just a few terms you have to understand before we dive into ChatGPT specifically. Okay, we, we know what a model is, right? A model is you've trained the data, look for patterns, and now persist that, so I wanna use it later on. That's a, that's a model, right? And if, you, in, if you're a meteorologist, you've known about this for most of your career. If you're in finance, you know about financial models. It's no different, it's no different. A large language model is a model that's based on text. It's based on text, language, right? So, language is not thought. So when you watch these TV programs and read these silly, write, read these silly articles about, you know, is the machine thinking? Is it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's looking for patterns in text. That's, it's, that's what it's doing. And people say, is it gonna be artificial eating this, this you know, new general intelligence thing? We're gonna be, you know, it's gonna take over? No, it's not. It's not, right? So we're the smart ones on the planet. We have to tell our colleagues outside of tech, like, no, 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 it's not not gonna happen, right? This is not intelligence, this is pattern recognition. And generative AI is yeah, the word generative. You're generating something. If there was, you know, back in dot com, we were generating music, right, based upon patterns. That's the same thing. But now we're doing, we're generating text. So a language model is generative text, generative uh, AI for text. Okay, ever got that? that that's the basic uh, foundation. So we know how popular ChatGPT is. I mean, I think it's the fastest quote unquote application in history. 
Right? Millions of people are using it. So, okay, what exactly is it? So it's GPT, generative pre-trained transformer. So what does that mean? So we had, we've had ML for quite a long time, right? And we read about like, you know, you need you know, thousands of machines running in the cloud, thousands of instances and do training. So what happened recently? Well, in 2017, Google, eight of Google's researchers, um, their AI researchers, came up with a new architecture for ML. Okay, Pr prior to that paper, to train something, you had to send the data sequentially. You had to train the data sequentially. So if you had a lot of data, that would take a long time. What do you think the big breakthrough was with transformers? Parallelism. We all know about threads and what's the benefit, it's parallelism. Or, uh, so, so the transformer architecture looks at text at the same time, you know, the chunks of text at the same time. So that was the big breakthrough. So the transformer architecture, which was created by the, the, the Google uh, researchers, eight of them, seven of them left Google to start their own companies, so there's only one left. So all, all, these, all these new things are based upon that transformer architecture. So that was the big breakthrough. And uh, at the tail end of this, this presentation, we'll talk about what's the next thing after, after OpenAI? Well, we have machines that have threads. We can do stuff on our desktops. That's the next big thing. So that was the big moment, was the parallelization of these algorithms. So that's what, a, a, that's what the T is in the generative pre-trained. Pre-trained just means you have a model. It's pre-trained, right? Because most of us, being application developers, just give me the model, I, I'll get the new data, and we'll see if it how it compares against um, the, the pre-trained model. And we know that ChatGBT, what was brilliant about ChatGBT when you use you know, uh, the app is that it was simple. Right? Why was, when Google came out, why was that so simple? It was just a little text. It was, it was really elegant, perfect, right? So when they designed the API for ChatGBT, they used a chat UI, right? the, the, the whole um, metaphor. It was friendly to everybody. Everybody knew how to use it. That was the brilliant thing about it. You didn't have to be a techie. You could use it really simply. So that's, that's the API. So it's a chatbot. But I'll talk about specifically what, is, what does that mean in, the, in a slide or two. It, they have other services. There's one called Dolly for images. And there's one for Whisper, which is voice recognition that converts it to text. You would imagine that, of course, they would want to use you, they want you to use Whisper to, to do voice recognition to generate text to feed into their engine. Okay, so, so I didn't see a diagram that kind of split up all the service, so I created my own slide. I think that's, uh, that Alan Kay said that. If you don't see something, just create. <laughs> just go ahead and create it. So um, we know about the chat, the, the chat uh, set of services. By the way, there's APIs for all this. There's a, there's a chat um, set of APIs. There's text completion. In other words, you can tell ChatGBT, like, here's a, a big abstract. Give me a one sentence summary. So there's that set of um, APIs. There's code completion. So since text is such a big thing to look for patterns, code is a smaller data set. Right? There are very rigid rules for code as opposed for language. So it's actually pretty good at code. And then there's image generation for Dolly. Dolly is like a riff, riff on. Wally, right? Wally and Salvador Dali. It's like a computer humor. Speech to text, which whisper. Um, but you know, honestly, the image recognition, uh, the, excuse me, the image generation and the speech to text um, are being surpassed by other companies. Like if you ever use Midjourney, I mean, that's like beyond Dolly. I mean, that's really, really interesting things. And then whisper. I mean, how many? voice recognition things that we have nowadays. So this, yeah, it's nice, but it's, the, it's their text language models that are interesting. Now the bottom two are really cool. And I, w I wanna point out too, so when, when you use ChatGBT, um, 
it, first of all, it, it only knows about, first of all, it only knows about text patterns. It's not really an information tool. Don't think of it as like a search information tool. First of all, only, it doesn't know anything past September 21, September 2021, unless you train it. And I'll tell you a funny story about how I found out. But the, the two bottom ones, so you could fine tune the model that, that ChatGPT has. Like if you work for a company and you have your own set of documentation and you want users to interact, it, interact through a, a chat interface, well, you want to train it on your, on your information and your content. You could do that. There is a, what's called a fine tuning API where you give it the data and you give it like, you know, possible answers. Here are answers for these types of questions. So you give it information. And obviously the more information, the, the better. And, and then that's called fine tuning. And then there's also the embeddings, which allow you to, you can get um, what's called an embedding vector, which all that means is that it tells you how one text is related to another set of text. So if you want to get really geeky with like comparing text relationships, there's a whole API for that. A, that's really more data science-y. People don't talk about the bottom two, but to me, I think that's what the really interesting thing, things are. Okay, so, so the interface, um, they scoured the internet for better or for worse, right? Uh, on getting text from books, Wikipedia, New York Times, GitHub. I'm not sure they looked at all the OSS licenses of all the, so I think the big winners in this, the, the, the early phase of ML here is that the IP lawyers <laughs> are gonna make up, if I was an IP lawyer, I was like, oh, baby, I'm golden for the next few years. So um, we'll see what happens with that. Okay, whoops. So the API is very simple, but I'm, mean, excuse me, the, the user interface is very simple, but let's talk about the API. So the, my very first question to ChatGPT was to, Give me a curl script, because if, 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 I, if I have a curl script, I can figure out how to do the Java part or any other language. So give me a curl script that connects to ChatGBT um, and uses this certain model. Okay, so I got something back. It's like, oh, this is pretty cool. It's like, I just cut and copy paste it. So I copied it and I ran it and it didn't work. I was like, what? It's like, well, this, is, this is really bad. So, I, I was forced to use the documentation. <laughs> I was surprised it didn't say RTFM when I, when I said, said, give me some text. But um, so what I found out is that, okay, let's, it's not giving me the right API. So, so I, I changed it and it worked. Then I realized it doesn't know anything past September 2021. So it didn't even know its own API. The API it gave me was deprecated. <laughs> so um, just remember that it, it's it's not an information tool. It's, it looks for text patterns. It's really it's quite interesting. But remember what it is. But so this this is a, a working curl script, um, and it it returns. I asked for it. What was my request here? It's a uh, JSON. So I asked for JSON back. And here I just piped it through uh, JQ, everyone's uh, favorite JSON utility, so, so you can read it. So in red there, I, I asked it for a joke, and then it gave me back the joke of the day. So that, it gives you back JSON if you ask for JSON, um, and then you just look for that particular element in JSON, and that's, that's your result. So it's, it's a REST interface. It's a pretty darn easy, right? And I said, like, I'm gonna write a little bash script to, so in, in like 10 minutes, I, I, I wrote something that's, that implements the chat interface. And it just sits in a loop, gets data, and then he sends it off to ChatGPT. No, it's no big deal, it's any, any college student could do this. Okay, so it gives you results like this. All right, hello, what's a good word for this? Can tell me a joke? So for some things, it's really good. But again, it looks for text patterns looks for highly likely text patterns. So um, I asked for who wrote JSR 381? 
It wasn't me. It wasn't my colleague Soren either. It had someone else's name because that was a name after the few words, that was the most likely name that it, it knew about. So it put another name there. So remember, it's not an information gathering tool. It might be in the future. You know, it might be also with the help of Microsoft and Bing and kind of working together, but by itself, it's text patterns. And, and here's another one. Here, I, here's a, a request, and the requests are called prompts. That's the terminology is prompt. So the problem, I'm, let's see if I can load this up a little bit. So I, I said, like, I want you to act like a stand-up comedian, and uh, I want a humorous take on the Java language. So it gives me back a little stand-up routine on Java, a little funny thing. So, but basically, I programmed it. I said, I told, told it what to do. I want you to act like a comedian, right? And I'll give you some information. So basically, I'm telling it, I'm programming it. I'm programming the engine. And it gives you back something really cool. So it's, it's useful, right? Very useful, and I, and I consider it a lot, plenty of times like it's like Grammarly++. It's a tool that I use. And the New York Java SIG, which you know, I'm part of with some of my fellow leaders, um, we send the abstracts from speakers to ChatGPT. It's like, could you make this more enticing for people to come to the meeting, right? Or, or write a funny version of this abstract. Because sometimes the abstracts we get are suboptimal. <laughs> and here's another one. So, here, so in, in the, the black part up top, I said, write a short, a sh uh, short science fiction script that uh, there's a story but in 2040, there's an Italian guy named Giovanni, right, vacation in Greece, and he's flying around in a quadcopter, um, and there's a bunch of aliens that attack him. It actually wrote a screen, little mini screenplay. So it's how you program the engine, and it's also interactive. So don't think of ChatGPT as like, it's a one way, here's a question, I just want to result, I'm done. It's like you're pair programming with this thing. Think of it like you're pair programming. That's nice, get a spam call while I'm doing a presentation, that's good. So think of it as, as this. There's an interesting video where there's um, someone who's a lawyer, a, re a research lawyer, that is talking to it, like, you know, text, of course, and it's going back and forth. It's so, like, give me the results of that, because no, that, that's not quite accurate. There was something else that happened there. He goes, okay, let me find that. And it was as if it was your pair programming. That was for law, but think of it as that. Your pair programming with a bot, with someone else. It, it's, a, the, the other, it's a bunch of bits, but it's another person, right? So here's the API reference. So if you go to openai.com docs API reference, it's a REST interface. You know, most of us know, you know, most of us that have more than a few years of experience know how to deal with a REST interface. So that's, that's where the API is. So since it's a REST API, um, it's pretty easy. So what I did is that I wrote a Java program this is before ChatGPT3, so I guess this is about a couple of months ago. So I wrote a, a, a Java program and everything worked fine. And then they came out with Java, uh, it came out with GPT 3.5 and my code broke. It's like, oh, come on. So I learned a lesson, like they, there's, there's these models, there's models for text, there's models for images, there's models for, for whisper, for voice recognition. Um, there's like 70, 70 models. Now, some of them for text, some of them for images. Uh, and I had to rewrite my code, <laughs> which <laughs> I'd rewrite it. Um, and there's JSON, there's Java, and curl, all dealing with doubles, the double quotes. Has anyone ever done that, dealing with double quotes in Java, shell, shell script, and JSON? Your head's going to explode. It's, it's just like a pain in the neck. So after like a couple hours, and it's like, you know, I have to escape the double quote here. No, I have to pass it over here. No, I let that go here. Let me single quote a second. I just gave up. I said, yeah, I'm gonna go just find it on GitHub. So I, I, found, I found a lot, like we all do. I found it on GitHub. There's one called a Little Cat, uh, which I thought was really simple. And this, uh, this code uses his, his library. It's very, very simple. I thought his code was very clean. 
Um, the only problem is that it didn't cover the entire API. So the coverage wasn't 100%, and it covered only a certain part. So, but it was trivially easy. I mean, I wrote this program like, you know, it's like an hour, it's like it's working fine. Well, well, it just gets input from the user, it calls, calls his library, calls ChatGPT, and, and we're done. There's another one called OpenAI uh, slash Java that's now available, that covers the entire API. So I would recommend that use open, go to GitHub, look for OpenAI-Java, and it's more comprehensive. It's a little more complicated than the simple one that the uh, little cat has, um, but it, it's more comprehensive. And it works, so. And here, here's um, you know, one of the leaders in the, Java, the New York Java SIG uh, took the code that I had and, and just, or I actually took the code from little cat and just created a Spring Boot version. So, and I think, I don't know if Rodrigo's here, but he did it in like 10 minutes. So it's easily integratable on, on the server side. Okay, now how do you use this stuff? Okay, so, so when you send, a, when you talk to the engine, there's a language. And of the 70 models, and the number of models changes from week to week apparently, the one, one day it was 72, the other was 66. Every model has its own language that you talk to it, unfortunately. Well, I guess maybe fortunately or unfortunately. So if you use a different model, you may have to change your, the message that you send to it. I'm hoping that they evolve their APIs more consistently in the future, because mine broke if for you know, just one change, but I'm hoping that they're more consistent in the future. Okay. Um, so it knows a lot about code. Actually, I'm sorry, I take that back. So here's a program that says write a Java program. Is there, if, if you remember what I said before, the world of code is much smaller than, than English. So, and they're rigid rules. So it's really good at code. Or it's re really good at generating, I don't hesitate to use the word good code. It's good at generating code. <laughs> and and here's, here's a Java program, it's certainly not formatted, but there's a Java program that prints Hello World. So what about this? So you get a requirement, like, like your manager or some user says, um, I have a bunch of PDFs in, in a folder and I need to get the text out of the PDFs and I want you to save the text in the same file name but put 010203. It's like, how long do you think you can write a program like that? How fast can you write a program that does that? Fully tested? A couple hours, right? A couple hours. I hit the, the uh, generate button and I got that in like five seconds. And I said, well, could you regenerate another version? And I got that in five seconds. Is it good code? I don't know, I have to read it. Right, it's, so it's generating code based upon text patterns. And sometimes it's useful, it's like, well give me a template so I can get started with something. That's where it's really good, but you really have to look at the code, right, to make sure it's, just, it's, is it perfect code? No, hell no. But you have to look at it, it's up to you this, whether it's good code or not. Actually, I was surprised I put comments in there. I can't get my students to put comments in the code. <laughs> so you use it like a pair programmer, right? And remember, it's a conversation too. Don't just assume like what it gives you is like, okay, well that's the result. No, have a conversation with it. Right, so there's a whole art of the prompt, right, of, of giving it requests. So here's a bunch of interesting ones. So here's the first one is I, get, I want a table with the 10 most populous cities, and I want the name, the population, all kinds of data about those cities, and give me the JSON for that too. And we can do that, we don't need ChatGPT to do that. But let's see. New instance of ChatGPT. Make sure it's a fresh instance. And I hope it's not too busy. Thank you. Okay. 
And I actually, do you notice that ChatGPT, it gives you back data like in spurts? Why do you think they're doing that? They just want to emulate a human talking to you. So what they're doing is that they're, they're using um, server sent events. If you're a web person, you know what that is, right? It's basically selling, sending chunks and you're receiving in chunks. They only did that so it's emulating a human to make it more human-like. You don't have to. You could say turn off, SS, turn off SSE, turn off server sent events, and you get the whole thing as one chunk. There's generating the, the JSON too. So could you do this yourself? Yeah, sure I could, but it's kind of tedious, right? And if I had voice input, I would just say that and it would generate this for me. Put it back to here. So how about this one? Act like a Linux terminal. I want you to behave like a Linux terminal. So let's see what happens there. Oops. Oh, that line break. <laughs> Give me a virtual machine without it being a virtual machine. Because I just, I just look at text, right? And just give me, so I can say um, ls dash la. <laughs> it's behaving like a Linux terminal without being a Linux machine, right? Or, I'm sorry, a bash you know, interface to Linux. So you tell it how to behave. So I, I won't, well actually I want to do the last one. So you, you can ask questions like I didn't, don't know what this regular expression does or give me a, uh, a, a sed script or what does this Unix command do. It'll explain it to you. It'll explain it to you. Now this one, since I know we have some Java FX people in the audience, but. <laughs> Let's copy that. Now I'm going to start a fresh session. There. So it's it gives me a Java FX since it's been a while since I wrote Java FX. This is like a good instead of me looking it up, it's like all right, it's giving me a, a helping hand. So it's giving me a working Java FX application. But let's say you know this is a, a, a desktop GUI, right, and it's, or some sort of GUI. And I could say stop generating that. And I said, like, um, make the button, because I asked for, for a button, let's make the button red. Oops, R-E-D. It'll tell me, like, okay, this is how you do it. And then if, let's say, Okay, with some code, and I'll say, put uh, the text area at the top. It'll give me code to do that. Is it perfect code? No, you have to look at it, right? Is it maintainable code? I mean, coding is only one part of our jobs. Sometimes it's a small part of our jobs. But you know, it, it's you have to read the code, make sure that before you put anything in production, and certainly don't copy paste it and put it in production. <laughs> just definitely do not do that, right? Okay, I'm running a little bit out of time, but okay. So you really have to understand how to talk to these engines. Right, these engines are, are interactive. And don't go by what you read about ChatGPT. It's just, you know, ChatGPT convinced me to, to uh, leave my wife. It's like, what are you, nuts? Like, 
if, if, if a text engine is convinced you to leave your white plate, you have other problems. So it's text patterns. That's all it is. It's text patterns. It's very useful. It's very useful. Okay, so what's, what do you think the fastest programming language is? English. And it's not just developers, but so there are people, there are now companies looking for prompt engineers, paying a lot of money for prompt engineering. Now, I just showed small, small snippets of how you program using prompt engineering, but there's way more sophisticated things you could do. Um, that is a, a, a big field. Okay. So we, we have to learn these tools, because if you're a professional developer and you don't use these tools, you're in trouble. Because there's going to be programmers that are going to program a lot faster than you. So you have to learn how to use them properly. Right, use them, use them properly. And there was a study that little down the bottom right that programmers are 50% more productive. But you do have to read the code and make sure it does exactly what you know was want. But what's so? What's next? You know how to, how to pair program with a bot. I mean, it's how to converse with an engine because that means you're you're not going to have a friend correcting your work all the time. And it could catch mistakes in your code. It said, here's my code. It's like, what do you think of this? Like, should I change this? It'll actually respond as if it's a person, like it's going back and forth, because it's looking for text patterns. Um, and fine tuning and embeddings. So again, if you have your own corpus of data that, you know, your own data sets, and you want to train it on your data sets, because the code that it uses is coming from GitHub, the general GitHub repo, you might say, like, you know what? I'm going to create a vintage wine. I'm going to create only, I'm going to talk to these really great programmers. I'm going to create the great programmer. I'm going to talk to James Gosling, and I'm going to talk to this guy, that guy. So, so all these great programmers. And I'm going to create a vintage model of that. And you might have some other, da other data sources, and you say, like, I'm going to create, I have this, you know, this great, um, interesting uh, recipes or algorithms or whatever it is, and you create specific uh, models for that. And the next step is that there's now transformer architecture on the desktop using threads. So and that's, now that's the bit, next big thing. Instead of using these you know, big machines for, for learning, because of the transformer architecture, the next thing you're going to read about is people from like using, Facebook has their language model called Llama. Stanford has their thing called Altaca that use desktop threads. That's the next thing. So if that's the way things are going, we're going to start seeing this thing being in, in embedded devices. And then we're going to see federations of engines. Right? So that's the way things, things are going. So it's, it's interesting, but you have to be aware of what is this tool, how do I use it? There are some concerns, right? So it generates a spam pretty damn easily, right? It, it can create pretty convincing emails I could send out to fake people out. So, th th so there's the, the bad side of things. Like any new thing, there's always a bad side. I worry about beginning programmers, because already I get young programmers saying, like, why should I learn coding if it's going to be done by a machine? It's a, I get that question a lot. Or people are changing field. They're going from the service industry, because of the pandemic, they want to go into the IT industry thinking it's safer. And now they're questioning their, their move, because now, Maybe service industry isn't a bad place to be. It can't be replaced by, 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 by a machine. And I, I, I worry about, you know, will this take away jobs? And, and, the, and people say, like, well, no, new jobs will be created. Usually it's the, it's the head of these companies that say that. Like, don't worry about it. We're going to create, you know, brand new jobs. Some jobs will disappear, but, you know, there'll be... New jobs created. I said, well, that's true, but what about the people that had those jobs? What about their families? What about the millions of people that do that? Well, they'll be displaced. I, you know, it doesn't sound right to me. Yeah, that, that happened for other inventions, but we've got to be smarter than that, right? It's, it's the modern age. We should educate people. It shouldn't happen. So it's, um, there's the bad side, right? But this is, a, we're at the start of this trend, of the machine learning trend, right? So even though it started decades ago, we're now, it's, now it's viable. Now it's viable for the average person. 
So this is going to be with you the rest of your careers. And I only have five minutes. There's, there's no way I can show, show code. Um, I, I'll stop here in case I have questions. I mean, you, code's code. I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not magic, right? So thank you very much. Any, any questions? Yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so I just said that for impact. It's not just English, it's language. Language, you know, it could be any, any language. Uh, so right now, English is the predominant language on these things, but there other languages are quickly catching up. Because the way it looks at, at words in the language, it's not words, it's these things called tokens, which are, which are part of words, the important parts of words, and whether it's English or some other language, it doesn't matter. So it's really good at translation. Will the, will the answer be in differently in different languages? That's a good experiment. That's a good experiment. Yeah. Question. Um, other than the KSR that you mentioned, are there, are there any other uh, tools in Java to uh, implement other machine learning use cases? So, so there, there are other Java APIs for ML. So we looked at them, that was the reason why we did our work, that they weren't Java friendly. You really had to understand pointers, you know, C language things. And while we did, since we were formerly C programmers, we understood that, but we couldn't see the average Java developer doing that. So we built real OO interfaces and, and uh, you know, so you can use it as a modern Java developer. Any other questions? I'm sorry. Right. So when you fine tune, and so what, this is no, this is specifically Open AI. So when you ch when fine tune ChatGPT, you can actually save the file on your account, and then you can you can provide another service on top of that that uses your account and 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 do it that way, then, then your account gets charged, and then you have to charge the people to cover your money, right? That's the way it works. But you can save files, yes. So it's not available by default to the general user? No, but you have to, that's a paying, that's a, but it's not a lot of money. It's like $20 a month or something like that. And for a company, it's like, it's nothing. No, I mean, people will like to use it for their account. Right, exactly. So, you, so it's, it's more comprehensive than just an API. You can actually save models under your account. So thank you very much. Thank you.